I'm designing an Arduino powered hexapod from scratch, and in this video, my RC controller is finally getting a much needed makeover. Don't get me wrong, the old one worked, and honestly, it did its job pretty well. But if I'm going to make a controller from scratch, it should at least be better than a PS2 controller. So I decided to redesign the entire thing. This video is going to be part one of the redesign, where I cover everything from designing the schematic and keycad up to testing the actual PCB. Made from the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. Why not just use a PS2 controller or a mobile app? Why are you making it from scratch? It comes down to three main points. One, I wanna have physical controls. The flexibility of a phone's touchscreen is unparalleled, but I hate touchscreen joysticks. Physical joysticks and physical buttons for that matter feel so much better to use. Two, I wanted to be able to add whatever I want. If I used a PS2 controller, for example, I'd be stuck with two joysticks, 10 buttons, four bumpers, and a gyro. Now, that sounds like a lot, and it is, but what if I wanted to add potentiometers or maybe even a screen? I'd be out of luck. Three, making it from scratch will give me, and whoever else makes it, a much better understanding of how things work. Also, I decided to stream the entire process. If you wanna see any of the streams used in this video, check the description. At this point, I had only ever made a single custom PCB, my Hexapods PCB. I made it in Easy EDA, which is an online PCB creator. And I did not use a schematic. I went right into PCB creation because that's all I knew how to do. Now, it worked, but the process was error prone and tedious. When making a custom PCB, you always want to start with a schematic. The schematic dictates how all the pins are connected, and when making the PCB, it basically forces you to do things correctly. So a schematic sounds great, right? Well, yeah. Problem is, I had no idea how to make one. I decided to use KiCad. It's open source, and from what I heard, it worked great. Before the stream, I followed this KiCad tutorial series. I went through the first six or so videos, and it gave me a pretty good idea on how to create the schematic. This first iteration would be very similar to the original controller. It would use the Arduino Nano, and have two joysticks, two potentiometers, and an NRF chip. The difference is I also wanted to have a gyroscope and a screen. All of this uses literally every pin except one on the Nano. I started the stream by wiring the symbols up. This was relatively easy to be honest, just not quick, since it takes time to make sure everything is wired how it's supposed to be. With the schematic finished, the latter half of the stream was spent creating the footprints, which are used on the PCB. There was definitely a learning curve here, but I slowly figured out the workflow, and by the end of the day, I had the schematic and all the footprints made. Off stream, I was looking for ways to add some more pins to the Nano, and I stumbled upon a shift register. This thing would theoretically allow me to have access to five more pins. I used these five extra pins to add a rotary encoder, a back button, and two bumpers. The thought was the rotary encoder and the back button would be how you navigate the user interface if you didn't want to use touch. I started the stream figuring out how I wanted the inputs and the screen to be laid out on the controller itself. I ended up placing the screen in the dead center, the joysticks on either side of it, the potentiometers on top, and the back button and rotary encoder below the screen. After figuring out where I wanted everything else, I spent the next nine hours wiring the traces. If I was to do it now, it'd probably take about an hour. I ended up with this. The PCB itself was, as far as I can tell, done perfectly. Fortunately though, I did not order it. The plan was to test as much as possible on a breadboard first, and thank God I did. The goal of this stream was to wire up the components in real life the same way I did for the PCB. I'd make sure everything's working and then order the PCB. This was delusional. There was no way I was ordering the PCB this stream. I started with only wiring up the Nano and the NRF chip. I wanted to make sure these two things worked before testing anything else. If you didn't know, the NRF chip is how the controller actually sends its data to the Hexapod, which also has an NRF chip. After wiring everything up, I plugged in the Nano and uploaded some test code and the code wouldn't upload. Programmer is not responding? What? I tried everything I could think of, except, you know, swapping out the Nano. After 45 minutes, I finally did. Fortunately, I ordered three. And of course, this worked. Yay. Next was testing the NRF chip. This one was the antenna version, and I've actually never been able to get this version working. I was hoping using a 3.3 volt voltage regulator instead of powering it directly from the 3.3 volt out of the Nano would do the trick. 
but it did not. I was about to give up and just use the non-antenna version, but chat had one more idea. Solder the capacitor directly to the NRF. The capacitor is supposed to be as close to the NRF as possible, so I figured why not? It actually worked. It works. It actually works. This was the first time I had ever gotten the antenna version working. The first three hours of this stream were spent trying to get the rotary encoder to work more consistently. And of course, this was a massive waste of time. Please learn from my mistake. If you're going to use a rotary encoder, use interrupt pins. Chat once again to the rescue. They suggested using a PCF8575 component, which is an IO extender that uses I2C. This thing is amazing. It turns the two I2C pins into 16 digital pins. This would not only free up the interrupt pins for the rotary encoder, but it would let me add so many more inputs. I immediately bought three off of Amazon and got to work on updating the schematic. I ended up adding four toggles, four bumpers, four buttons, and I made the rotary encoder use the two interrupt pins. I ended the day testing the gyroscope, and against all odds, this actually did work first try, which was a nice change of pace. Off stream, I remade the PCB to use the new IO extender. Also, a much larger breadboard that I ordered had arrived, so it was time to test. For the first six hours, I got the IO extender working, the gyro working, the rotary encoder working, the buttons working, the potentiometers working, the NRF working, and the power switch working. Things were going well. Then I started working on the screen. Things stopped going well. The screen was a 3.5 inch 480 by 320 touch screen. This was nice and it was the perfect fit for the controller or so I thought. It used 3.3 volt logic but the nano pins were 5 volts so I had to use a logic level shifter to turn the 5 volts into 3.3 volts. No matter what I tried I could not get this screen to work. That is, until I tried swapping out the level shifter with voltage dividers, which got it to work. The problems did not stop there. The touchscreen feature of the screen just didn't work at all, which was annoying, but not a deal breaker. What was a deal breaker was that the NRF chip no longer worked at the same time as the screen. For the last four hours of this 12 hour stream, despite my best efforts, I could not get them both working at the same time. I wasn't even able to figure out what was causing the issue. My best guess is that because the NRF chip and screen both used the SPI pins, there was some sort of interference, possibly an issue with the screen's library. I don't know, still don't. I decided that the screen was way too much for the nano to handle, so I ordered a different one. I bought a 2.4 inch, 128 by 64 black and white OLED screen. The old screen had 172.8 thousand colored pixels. The new one, 8,192 black and white pixels. The 21 times less pixels combined with not having color makes the new screen update so much quicker. After about an hour, I was able to get the screen and NRF chip working at the same time. My next goal was to have the hexapod send back the value of its current sensor to the controller and then have the controller display that current sensor value on the screen. Easy or so I thought. For the life of me, I could not get this working. I tried literally everything to the point where I had two brand new scripts, one for the controller and one for the hexapod with only the NRF code on it. I worked on this problem for eight hours straight. I abhor ending on a bad note. And this would be the second day in a row, but it was 5 a.m. So yeah, I gave up. After mentally recovering from yesterday's learning experience, off stream, I realized what the issue was. It was the same problem I had when uploading the code to the Nano on that very first day. It was the chip itself. I didn't suspect it was the chip at first because single direction communication was working. But bi-directional communication with NRF chips only works with the plus version. And when ordering the Hexapod PCB from PCBWay, in the bill of materials, I had entered the non-plus version. I swapped out the Hexapod's NRF chip with an NRF plus chip, and it worked. Here's how it works. 
With normal NRF communication, the transmitter sends data, and every time the receiver receives data, it sends a little message back to the transmitter acknowledging that it successfully received the data. This message is called an ACK, short for acknowledgement. And if you have the correct type of NRF chip, you're actually able to send a custom ACK message. For example, when the controller is talking to the hexapod, the hexapod is able to talk back through the ACK. After three hours of integrating the test code into my actual hexapod and RC code, I was finally able to display the current from the hexapod on the remote controls screen. After that, chat introduced me to something very interesting. This is insane. Oh my God. The Arduino Mega Pro. It's literally an Arduino Mega, but the size of two nanos. I decided this would replace not only the Hexapod's Arduino Mega, but also the remote controls Arduino Nano. This would allow me to get rid of the IO extender completely. It also would give me additional analog pins for anything I want. With the Nano, I had zero extra available. So yeah, I ordered three on the spot. After that little tangent, I went through the display library I was using for the screen, U8G2, and made a little reference document of the functions I would probably be using. This way I wouldn't need to be searching through the API docs when the time came to actually code the UI in Arduino. I spent the rest of the stream working on the UI, but instead of just making it in Arduino right off the bat, I decided to create a mockup. Reason being, it is so much easier to iterate and experiment with a mockup compared to immediately making it in Arduino in C++. And once the mockup is made, all I have to do is copy it since all of the decisions are already made. I chose Godot 4, which is an open source game engine, to create my mockup. Why? Because I wanted to. I could have used any program I wanted, to be honest, even pencil and paper, but I missed working in Godot, and having a functional mockup compared to just a bunch of static slides makes it way easier to get a feel for the user experience. I was able to get a pretty decent start on the UI's main page. Most notably, I decided I wanted to display a representation of the current state of the hexapod on it. The plan is to show which legs are touching the ground and where the legs actually are relative to the body. Off stream, my Mega Pro arrived. So of course that means I remade the entire schematic and PCB. Now that I'm using the Mega Pro, I had additional analog pins. So I figured why not use one to read the controller's battery voltage. For the first three hours of the stream, I worked on implementing just that. And once I got it working, I spent another hour to make it detect when the controller was charging. With the battery display working, I spent the rest of the stream on the mockup UI. In addition to a battery indicator for the controller, I wanted to add some more data about the hexapod to the main page. I decided on four pieces of data. The hexapod's battery voltage remaining, its current usage, the max speed, and the height off the ground. I chose voltage and current because they're just good to know, and I chose max speed and height because those two things can be changed with the potentiometers, so knowing their current value is important. I'm not sure how well the icons will translate onto a true 128 by 64 pixel display, but I'm sure I'll be able to make something work. This stream, my only goal was to finish the mockup UI, and I did. For the main page, I centered the hexapod, and I also added an icon in its body to represent whether or not it was connected to the controller. I made the controls page, which will display the function of any button you press on the controller. The controller has a lot of buttons, so this should be very helpful. The gate display on the main page not only shows you what gate is currently selected, but it can also be used to cycle through all of the gates, which lets you quickly change the gate without going into the menu. Speaking of which, the menu. I added a scrolling list with four pages, gate, settings, offsets, and stats. The gate page is where you can select a hexapod walking gate, which is basically how the hexapod moves its legs to walk. Also, an animation of the gate you have selected will be displayed on the right. The settings page is where the settings will be. I know, shocker. The offsets page is where you can change the servo offsets. Currently I change these in code, but changing them through the controller will make tuning the servos so much more convenient. And finally, the stats page. I plan on displaying some interesting stats. That's it. Maybe a stat reset button as well. But yeah, that's it for the mockup UI as well as the streams. If you have any suggestions or ideas for the UI, let me know in the comments. 
23 days after that first stream, I was finally ready to order the PCB. I exported the Gerber files and ordered the PCB from PCBWay, the sponsor of this video. PCBWay offers a ton of different services. Chief among them is, you guessed it, PCB fabrication. Every PCB I've gotten from them has been flawless, and this one was no exception. I ordered five of them, which cost $35 plus $15 shipping for a total of $50, but that was only because my PCB was over 100 millimeters wide. I recently learned this. If your PCB's width is less than 100 millimeters and your PCB's height is less than 100 millimeters, you can get 10 of them for $5 plus shipping, which is a fantastic deal. A huge thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Check them out with the link in the description. I planned on including all the testing and assembling I did with the new PCB, but this video is already too long, so you'll have to wait till part two. But I'm happy to say that it works. I did make some modifications, and I may already have an updated version that should be even better, but this will all be covered in the next video. The only things left to do are design the case and code the UI in Arduino. After that, I'll be working on an assembly tutorial and a kit so you guys can build it too. That's it for this video. Consider joining the Discord server. It's an awesome place to hang out and talk about robotics. Link in the description. I'll see you there.